Hello and welcome back to All About Russia. My name is Andrew and today we're going to be looking at one of the forested republics nestled on the Volga River, the Republic of Chuvashia. Chuvashia, or the Chuvash Republic, is in the centre of Russia, in the Volga Federal District and the Volga Vyatka Economic Region. It is over 7,000 square miles in size, making it the 74th largest federal district and larger than the nation of Fiji. Its population is just over one and a quarter million people as of the 2010 census, making it the 41st most populous federal district and making its population smaller than that of East Timor. Within the Russian Federation, it shares borders with the Mari El Republic to the north, the Republic of Tatarstan to the east, the Ulyanovsk Oblast to the south, the Moldovia Republic to the southwest, and the Nizhny Novgorod Oblast to the west. Being in the centre of Russia, the Chuvash Republic is heavily forested, with nearly a third of the country made up of woodlands. Nearly 30% of all land in the Republic is under cultivation due to the abundant good soil found there, with the remaining third made up of water sources, uncultivated meadows and gentle sloping hills. The highest point in the Republic is Red Mountain, a hill near the village of Yebanovska near the Tatarstan border. The longest river in the Republic is the Volga, of which 87 miles of it runs through the northern part of the Chuvash Republic. The Republic is named, perhaps unsurprisingly, for the Chuvash people who reside there. As such, both Chuvash and Russian have official status, with the former widely spoken by the populace. The entire Republic runs on Moscow Standard Time. The flag of the Republic is a yellow background, with a burgundy border at the bottom. In the centre is a runic interpretation of the Tree of Life. The yellow represents the wealth, justice and mercy of the people. The burgundy represents dignity, power and hope, whilst the Tree of Life in the centre is representative of the Chuvash people, its runic stylings in reference to the original script of the Chuvash language. The flag was adopted on the 29th of April 1992. The Republic is administered into 21 districts, with the capital, Cheboksari, being its own administrative district. The day of the Republic is the 24th of June. Humans have inhabited the Chuvash Republic since at least 4000 BC, with evidence of the comb ceramic culture being found in that republic. This was an earthenware using culture that stretched from Javashia to Finnmark, and thus leaves us with some questions as to who exactly these early humans were. Further archaeology has helped us to create something of a picture though. In the 6th century, the territory of the modern day Javashia was part of old Bulgaria and was the home of the Bulgars and the Sabir people a people who are arguably the ancestors of the modern Chuvash. This was on the periphery of their territory however, and when wars with the Khazars to the south occurred in the following century, it would see the population divided. Some headed south to the Balkans, but many more headed further north to Chuvashia proper, where the state of Volga Bulgaria was founded. Though vassalised by the Khazars to the south, the region still prospered, thanks in no small part due to the very fertile land around the Volga River and the trade connections that that river gave them access to. This saw a growth in cities, including one in modern day Chavashia called the Vida Suva, on the site of what is now Chepoksari, as well as trade with partners from as far away as Norway and Baghdad. With the decline of the Khazars in the 9th century, Volga Bulgaria began a period of consolidation and expansion, bringing large tracts of land in the Volga region under their control. In the 10th century, the Volga Bulgarian aristocracy converted to Islam, encouraging other ethnic groups in the multicultural Volga Bulgaria to do so likewise. This brings us to the first written mention of the region, though stated just as a part of Volga Bulgaria. The term Chuvashia would not find its way onto the written page for several more centuries. The Volga Bulgarians were not the only ones expanding, however, and the state soon came into contact and conflict with the Kievan Rus princes of the 11th century, whose raids sometimes reach as far as Chuvashia itself. This marks the first mention of Russians in the story of Chuvashia. Yet it would not be a power from the west that fell the region, but a power 
from the east. In the secret history of the Mongols, it recounts the conquest of the Volga Bulgarians in 1236 and the subsequent scattering of the population that managed to survive the onslaught to the north into the northern territories of Chuvashia and Tatarstan. Historians estimate up to 80% of the population of Volga Bulgaria were slain by the Mongols, with their largest city sacked and the state utterly destroyed. From this time onward, Chuvashia would be a part of the Ulus of the Golden Horde. Largely left alone, as long as tribute of slaves, honey and furs were paid regularly on time, the few inhabitants of the region now theorized to be a mixture of Sabir, Mari and other Turkic peoples, began to rebuild and a degree of prosperity returned to the region. The lack of sovereignty of Chivasha would prove telling however and in 1386 the forces of Timurlane would ravage the area. This invasion marked the decline of the Golden Horde as a coherent power in the region and in 1438 the Khanate of Kazan broke away from the Golden Horde holding Chivasha as part of its de jure holdings. The Russians returned to our story in 1468, when Russian troops on the way to the Khan of Kazan passed Shupaskar, a fortress on the same location as modern day Chabuksari, which in the Chuvash language literally means place of Shupashk. This incident also makes it the first mention of the Chuvash in any written sources. This would also mark the first of many Russian boot on Chuvash soil. Instability in the Kazan Khanate throughout the 1530s and 40s encouraged the Chuvash and Mari tribes to abandon the Tatar Khan and ally with Ivan the Terrible, sending as many as 30,000 troops. In 1552, Ivan the Terrible conquered the Kazan Khanate and took Chuvashia under his protection. Initially, the changing of allegiance of the Chuvash people from the Khans of Kazan to the Tsars of Moscovy was depending on them being respected and their native rights being upheld. Perhaps unsurprisingly, they were not, and this led to almost immediate rebellions and conflict with the Russian state. Whilst the conflict with the Russians would be subdued in 1557 with a reaffirmation of those rights, the Nogai Mongols who had been steadfast allies of the Khans of Kazan, would repeatedly raid deep into Chuvashia well into the 17th century. As to help protect the Chuvash and cement the Tsar's authority, the fortress of Shepashkar was expanded upon and renamed Chepoksari after the neighbouring Chepok River. Always a fertile land, Chuvashia remained a target for nomadic horsemen for some time, prompting more forts and defences to be erected. Curiously, despite having been a part of Volga Bulgaria, the Chuvash who lived there had been largely animist in their native religion and in 1650 this was something the Russian state attempted to change by sending orthodox missionaries to the region. Frustrations with these conversion attempts as well as infringements on their native rights led to the Chuvash people revolting and allying themselves with Stepan the Razin. The ending of that rebellion brought greater Russian influence and in 1708 Chuvashia was incorporated into the Kazan government. This in turn led to greater proselytization efforts, Russian immigration and demands put upon the Chuvash nobility. In a pretty sad deja vu, this in turn led to the Chuvash revolting again, this time allying with Yemelian Pugachev in 1773. The danger of rebellions in this Volga region saw, once the rebellion had been crushed, Chuvashia divided between the Kazan and Simbirsk governors in 1796. Traditionally, Chuvashia had been a very fertile region, but the land had been held by local Chuvash and Russian landlords. The changes of the 18th and 19th centuries, most notably the emancipation of the serfs in 1861, saw many in Chuvasha want to find their own land to cultivate and not have to pay tithes to their lords. This in turn saw a huge exodus of people from the region, with as much as 40% of the population of Chuvasha leaving throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. The success of the 1905 revolution in St. Petersburg encouraged cultural intelligentsia among many of the minorities of the Russian Empire, including in Chuvashia. After 400 years of Russian immigration and cultural dominance, Chuvash culture in the region was much diminished, and this served as the tinder to rear the Chuvash cultural movement. 
With the start of the First World War, Chivashia, being far from any front, was initially little affected. However, by May 1917, as the stress of total war bore down on the entire Russian state, growing discontent in Chivashia led many in the elite to align themselves to the Idel Oral movement. The Idel Oral movement, literally taken from the Tatar for Volga Ural movement, was an ideological and political movement for greater integration and solidarity of the peoples of the Volga Oral rivers. In essence, this was an attempt to unite the people of the former Khanate of Kazan under Muslim leadership, an attempt which Yuvashia joined in January of 1918. Yet this was not universally agreed with, and almost immediately some forces in Chivashia fought against the state. By March 1918, Chivashia was under the sway of the Bolsheviks, and those Chuvash cultural and ideological intellectuals who had advocated joining the Idel Ural movement were purged. In 1920, as part of the Soviet approach towards national minorities, the Chuvash Autonomous Oblast was created. This, as the name might suggest, was part of an attempt to Sovietize and introduce communist philosophy to the Chuvash people. Sadly, the 1930s were a dark time for the people of Chuvashia. The Stalinist policies of repression saw thousands of new Chuvash nationalists and intellectuals shot or deported, with agricultural production in the region falling as a direct result. The indigenization of Chuvashia was ended and pan-Soviet immigration was encouraged. The Winter War of 1940 and the annexation of large tracts of Karelia actually saw many people moved from Chivashia to these delicate border regions to act as a counterweight to Finnish forces. The start of the Second World War affected Chivashia greatly. The mechanisation of the agricultural sector in the 1930s and destruction of the western regions saw Chivashia act as a breadbasket for the Soviet Union. Some industries were relocated to the region as well, though the lack of proper mineral resources meant that these were few in number. Additionally, over 200,000 men from across Chivashia volunteered for the Red Army during this time, with many more soldiers crossing over Chivashia to get to the war front. Of this 200,000 men number, around half died, and as such, after the war, whilst the region was structurally intact, like many of the central parts of the Soviet Union, it was still heavily depopulated. The 1950s and 1960s saw an evolution in Chivashia, changing from an agricultural area to an agro-industrial complex area. Factories that had produced bullets and bombs were transferred to make tractors and farm equipment. This evolution would continue far into the 1980s, where the troubles of the Soviet Union quickly became the troubles of Chuvashia and widespread economic and social issues wreaked havoc on the Autonomous Republic. In 1990, prompted by Gorbachev and Chuvash nationalism, the Autonomous Republic was upgraded to a Soviet Republic, giving itself greater autonomy and control over its finances. Yet the writing was on the wall, and the collapse of the Soviet Union saw widespread chaos and confusion across Chuvashia. The industries of the region began to close, no longer subsidised by the state, whilst agricultural prices began to dwindle. As such, an emigration from the region, notably of the ethnic Russian population, the richer western regions continued. This chaotic period began declining around 1998, and thankfully, by utilising its natural resources and great location for pan-Russian trade, the region has been brought back from the brink, and remains a middling area in Russia economically. As before stated, Chuvashia is a largely agricultural region, and as such this makes up a huge part of the economy. Rising food prices globally have helped this industry strengthen, but it's worth noting that it's still behind the pre-1990 rate of production. Of note, the vast farmland and crop production has led to a strong brewing sector, though this is yet to reach the Russian and international fame of the Baltica brewery. The region also boasts a small but growing industrial sector, particularly in electrical engineering and tractor production. In fact, part of the economic revival of the region stems from the fact that it is relatively densely populated in opposed to many other parts of Russia. This does not, however, mean that the area has an exceptionally large population. As before stated, the population of Chivashia stands, as of the 2010 census, at over a million and a quarter 
though this is down from the 2002 rate. The population of the capital stands at over 450,000. As of the 2010 census, the majority of the Republic are Chuvash at 67.7%, making it one of only eight titular republics to have the indigenous population as the majority. The next largest ethnic group is Russians at over a quarter, with small numbers of Tatars, Mordvins and other nationalities, notably on the periphery of the Republic, making up the remaining percentages. As of the 2014 Atlas survey, Christians make up over 70% of the Republic, with most of these being Russian Orthodox. Those who identified as spiritual but not religious make up the next group at nearly 15%. Atheists make up 7% of the population, with Muslims just at 3%. Smaller native faiths make up just over a percent, including the Chuvash native religion, Vitis and Yali. Drug use in the Republic is low, at 3.35 incidents of overdosing per 100,000, far lower than the national average. That said, alcoholism is actually higher than the national average, at 129.17 incidents per 100,000 people. The birth rate in the Republic stands at 1.88 children per woman, which is higher than the national average, but still lower than the 1990 rate. The head of the Republic is Oleg Alexeyevich Nikolaev, who came to power last year in 2020. He is an ethnic Chuvash born in that Republic, and is a member of a fair Russia. Am I reading this right? Yes, dear viewer. At the time of recording, Oleg is not a member of the United Russia Party, but instead is a member of the Fair Russia Party, a social democratic party within Russia. He came to power after being appointed by Vladimir Putin himself, as his predecessor, Mikhail Vasilyevich Ignatev, was outed after a vote of no confidence. Sadly, Michael has since died of COVID-19. The Chuvash Republic is a prosperous and culturally rich part of the Russian Federation. If you are fortunate enough to visit the region, things you might see are the Savor Ethnopark, famed for its dozens of carved cultural icons, the Chuvash National Folk Museum, and of course the mighty River Volga, seen by many as the mother river of the Russian state. Since the days of old Bulgaria, Chuvashia has been a land of milk, bread and honey, providing for all who have resided there. Rapidly recovering from the damage done in the 1990s, it is perfectly plausible that Chuvashia will become a prosperous part of the Russian Federation in the near future. Thank you for watching, my name is Andrew. Up next is the Republic of Crimea. Paka.